Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is our first video, I'll call it A, of a series of many videos I've created on the digestive system. The digestive system is a pretty lengthy topic, so I have broken it up into many smaller topics and created videos on those smaller topics. I hope you'll enjoy them. Let's not forget to ask ourselves why we eat. And the whole reason for why we eat is the same reason as why we breathe, and that is to ultimately be able to produce ATP so we can use that ATP to go through all kinds of other processes in the body, anywhere from muscle contractions to using the neurons in our brain to transporting materials, etc., etc. So we ingest glucose, this is glucose right here, we breathe in oxygen along with some water vapor, and then of course we find that we produce some waste products, carbon dioxide, we again exhale some water vapor, but we also therefore form ATP, and ATP is a molecule, adenosine triphosphate, that stores a lot of energy in those phosphate bonds. So let's take a look at the major structures of the digestive uh, system. First of all, it the two major parts of the digestive system consist of the uh, alimentary canal, as we can refer to it, or you might know it better as the GI tract or just the digestive tract. The GI tract stands for gastrointestinal. And anytime you see the word, or the prefix, I should say, uh, gastro, it always refers to the stomach. We'll even see a hormone called gastrin, which often, um, which is a hormone, I should say, that impacts the stomach, as we will see. The other major part includes all of the accessory structures of the digestive system, and you see those listed here. And don't forget that we include in that our teeth as well as our tongue salivary glands, the gallbladder, the liver, and the pancreas. But let's point out the major parts of our uh, GI tract. So we start here with the oral cavity, or we can just call it the mouth. From there, the food makes it into the pharynx, and then we're going to ha see that the food enters the esophagus, hopefully with the help of a functioning uh, epiglottis, so that the food doesn't end up in the trachea. The, the esophagus is just a tube that then eventually leads to a distended tube, which is your stomach. That's, that distended tube then narrows again to make your small intestine, which we see here all curled up in the orange color. Eventually, that small intestine is going to begin to be for, forming the large intestine, which goes up, across, and down, and squiggles a little bit before it forms the rectum and then eventually we get to the anus. So notice that the digestive tract or the GI tract is just a tube. You could almost think of it as a folding inward of our skin um, on both ends of the body. And consequently, we see that our digestive tract is essentially open to the outside, to the atmosphere at both ends. And consequently, too, we're going to see that pathogens can enter from the oral end and pathogens can enter from the anal end. So these are some things to bear in mind. We'll study more detailed gross anatomy after we've learned about the histology of the digestive tract. So let's move on to the microscopic anatomy of the alimentary canal or the histology. As is so typical for many of the hollow tubes in our body, whether it's the blood vessels, the respiratory tract, this time the digestive tract, we see these distinct layers that make up the wall. Uh, we re prefer to call those tunics. And you're pretty familiar already with the names of these tunics. We have a mucosa, which is the layer that directly lines the lumen, followed by the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and then the, the final or the most superficial layer is going to be either a serosa or an adventitia. And I'll explain which one we find where, serosa or adventitia. Uh, 
let's point out these four different tunics. Everything in the beige right here, plus this reddish layer, which is indeed some smooth muscle, we'll talk about that, makes up our mucosa. The brownish layer that surrounds the mucosa here is the submucosa, which is then followed by a thicker muscular layer than we see in the mucosa, right, referred to as the muscularis externa. And then finally we have our serosa or our adventitia, depending on where we are. So let's get started with the first layer, or the layer that is the closest to the lumen, that literally touches the lumen, the mucosa. And it itself is made up of three sublayers. We have the layer of epithelial tissue that we find in a good portion of the digestive tract, which tends to be simple columnar epithelial tissue. That is not the tissue for the whole digestive tract, let me warn you. For instance, the esophagus does not have that epithelial tissue. The esophagus, for instance, has stratified squamous epithelial tissue. But if we look at the gastro uh, intestinal tract, meaning from the stomach down into the small and large intestine, we will always see simple columnar epithelium, which is rich in goblet cells, more so in some areas of the digest of the GI tract, I should say. That simple columnar epithelial tissue then sits on top of an areolar connective tissue that may even have some reticular connective tissue, which in some areas is very rich in malt. Remember that is mucosa associated lymphatic tissue or lymphoid tissue. And we refer to that as the lamina propria, which should be a term that you're familiar with as well. Typically um, in the digestive tract, especially even in the respiratory tract, we see that the epithelial tissue sits on this so-called proper layer. And then we find in the mucosa, so we're still looking at the mucosa, a thin layer of muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue. And that we refer to as the muscular laris mucosae, literally saying the muscular layer of the mucosa, layer of the mucosa tunic. And it is mostly responsible for creating the folds that we see in the, in the stomach and in the small intestine and in the large intestine. So if we look at the functions now of this mucosa, and again, we're really primarily looking at the GI tract, that is from the stomach down into the small intestine, down into the large intestine, we see that the functions of the mucosa include secretion. Think, for instance, of the goblet cells that secrete mucus, but there are many other secretory cells or glandular cells that we're going to learn about. In the small intestine especially, we see absorption occurring. We don't see much absorption in the stomach, and we do not see much absorption in the large intestine, just minimal absor absorption there, but most absorption occurs in the small intestine. And of course, epithelial tissue, uh, since it lines the lumen, is also going to form some uh, level of protection. The submucosa that we see here in the brownish color is going to be made up of a relatively loose connective tissue that might actually transition into more of a dense connective tissue. In other words, it might become richer in fibers depending on where we are. It's going to definitely have some elastic fibers and some lymph nodules. And one of the important things to mention here is this is the layer where we see the so-called submucosal nerve plexus. We'll see another one in the next tunic, but these nerve plexi that I will mention, this one called the submucosal nervous plexus, is part of our enteric um, nervous system, which is often referred to as our gut brain or the intrinsic nervous system. So the extrinsic nervous system is going to once again include our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And then we have our gut brain, which we refer to as our intrinsic nervous system. We'll learn a lot more about this intrinsic nervous system. The thick muscular tunic that we see in the gastrointestinal tract 
is made up of at least, usually at least, two layers of smooth muscle. There could be an extra layer as we see in the stomach. And the first layer, or I should be more accurate in how I say that, the layer that touches the submucosa or the deeper layer is going to be a circular layer. Notice that the direction of the cells, as you can see here, is such that they form a circle. The next, the, the more superficial layer, on the other hand, that sits the closest to either the serosa or adventitia, is going to be made of, of cells that run along the length. And if you watch the cursor I'm, I'm creating here, um, they run along the length of the wall of the small intestine or the large intestine or the stomach. And so we refer to the cells, the smooth muscle cells that make this layer as longitudinal smooth muscle. So typically we find an inner circular layer of smooth muscle and an outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. And there are going to be some exceptions to that rule. This is the layer two, the muscularis externa, right? So we have a muscularis mucosa in the mucosa layer. Here we have a muscularis externa. Um, this is also the layer that makes the sphincter muscles in the GI tract. We'll point out those sphincter muscles as we study the gross anatomy in more detail of individual structures, like the stomach, for instance, or the large intestine, etc. Now, this is unlike the muc muscularis mucosa, which is mostly respond responsible for thro throwing the... Um, wall of, of our tube into folds, which helps increase the surface area sometimes, um, we find that the muscularis externa has different functions. It is actually going to be primarily involved in going through different muscle actions that allow for the food to be mixed and or for the, move, the, the food to be moved. So we talk about these two muscular actions. One is called segmentation, which refers to the mixing of the food. So segmentation refers to the mixing of the food, like kind of like what you do when you make a pie dough or any kind of a batter. You're mixing things together. While peristalsis refers to the movement of the food. Um, you know, when a, a, a snake eats a rabbit, you can literally see it being squeezed down the digestive tract of the snake. And um, that's what peristalsis is all about. It involves the circular as well as the longitudinal smooth muscles and how they contract and, and how that then impacts the movement of the food. We have another uh, myenteric. We have another, I should say, nerve plexus here. This time it's called a myenteric plexus, literally meaning myo as in muscle, enteric referring to um, the gut. And this is once again part of our gut brain. The myenteric plexus is labeled here on our figure with the help of these yellowish fibers within that, um, both within the submucosa, which would be your submucosal plexus, I should say, and then of course the myenteric plexus is limited to the muscle layer from there, the term myo. So that brings us to our very outer layer or the most superficial layer. We're going to see that it'll be called a, the serosa, which is your visceral peritoneum, by the way. In the structures that are inside of our peritoneal cavity. So all the structures that are considered to be inside our peritoneal cavity, or they are intraperitoneal, will have as their outer layer the visceral peritoneum. But we have plenty of structures that are not located inside of the uh, peritoneal cavity. And I will explain better on another, in another video what we mean by the peritoneal cavity. It's not exactly the same thing as the abdominal cavity. 
but we have plenty of structures that are not located within the peritoneal cavity. For instance, we have some structures that sit behind it and we call them retroperitoneal and they actually have both the adventitia as well as the serosa present. A structure that is not part of the abdominal cavity or even the peritoneal cavity and it does not sit behind or retro to the peritoneal cavity is the esophagus. And so the esophagus has adventitia only. Notice that the adventitia is a rather fibrous layer, so quite a few fibers present providing some protection. This then is the end of the first video on the digestive system in which we focused on the general gross anatomy of the digestive system, followed by a discussion of the general histology, particularly of the part of the digestive tract that starts at the level of the stomach. We refer to that as the gastrointestinal tract. In the next couple of slides, we're first going to take a closer look in what is meant by the peritoneal cavity, and then we'll take a look at how digestion is regulated.